Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's success story interview where we are going to be speaking with Paul. Um, thanks so much for being here with us, Paul. I really appreciate you taking the time. So thank you. Thank you, Seth. Appreciate it. Can you tell us a little bit about your match and like what specialty and what program you got into? Um, so thank you, Zef. Uh, I matched into anesthesia at the University of Arkansas Medical Sciences Center. Um, I'll be starting in on July 1st and uh, I got my number two spot and I'm glad that I matched. Amazing. What was the lead up to pursuing anesthesiology for you? So I was in a critical care nurse for three years in the ICU. And actually, I was a nurse before going. So in nursing school, my second to last semester, it kind of dawned on me. And I was like, I think I'm getting a hang of this. This is pretty easy. So I said, you know what? I think I should go to medical school. And a lot of my other friends also concurred that, yeah, Paul, maybe you might want to think about going to medical school. So I started to do my research. So I had to take um, additional classes like physics and chemistry in addition to my nursing coursework. And I didn't know what kind of doctor I wanted to be in nursing school. So when I, once I graduated, I did shadow some doctors. I shadowed some anesthesiologists, shadowed some cardiologists, um, shadowed some nephrologists. And while in the ICU, we kind of use the same drugs that anesthesia does. Um, we try to treat propofol. We have to get induction meds ready for intubations. We have to manage art lines. So it was a very similar crossover. That's kind of what led me to anesthesia. So how did you decide where you're going to medical school? Uh, so actually, I applied to, uh, once to a, um, so I did the whole MCAS kind of application, and I applied all over. And I only got one interview, and that was in 2016. I got an interview to St. Louis University. Um, I actually got in on the wait list. And a month, you know, like uh, two weeks before school started, they dropped me, and they said, oh, sorry, we're not able to offer you a position. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so I was like, well, I guess I got to, you know, apply next year because you can't, you know, I can't even apply to a Caribbean school at that point because this is deep into J July and, right. you know, all the applications for all schools have been closed. So I waited another year and I applied again for the 2017 cycle, but I applied only to SGU. I was like, you know what? I know I'm going to get in for sure. I didn't want to mess with the MCAS cycle. I probably could have gotten into somewhere. Um, if I retook my MCAT, but I just applied to SGU. And actually, I was in contact with SGU once I graduated nursing school. Okay. So I was like, what if, I, if, I, if I don't get into an American medical school, I know there's some more I can get into. So I kept in contact with them. They would be calling me every like three months. And I just, in 2016, leading up to 2017, I applied, I interviewed, and I got in. How was your experience when you got to SGU then? So I'm originally from Nigeria. My parents were born there and we go there every other year. So yeah. I knew, I was, yeah, you know, so I knew I was going to a foreign country and I think I was very comfortable with that because I'd been, you know, I lived in a foreign country for a maximum of three months. So mm -hmm. I was okay with that. And I was like, you know what? We're going here to get the MD and you got to go get what you got to get and leave. So going to the island, it was awesome. I mean, I was able to immerse in the culture learning different aspects of Caribbean culture um, and also intertwined with kind of the British culture too and mm -hmm. learning what you know carnival is all about and different foods it was it was pretty interesting so it gave me a whole experience it was pretty great I, I wouldn't be able to get it from an American school yeah and um, so when it actually came time for your rotations were you able to get anesthesiology electives in or how did that work for you so unfortunately, I wasn't able to. Um, at the time I was going to get my anesthesia elective, uh, COVID hit and yeah. moved all the students out of the hospital. So it was kind of crazy. Even American students got removed too. So nice. at the time I was supposed to be in the hospital, my COVID rotation, my anesthesia rotation got yanked. So that was a little setback. So I wasn't able to complete any formal anesthesia rotation before the ERAS cycle. So I went into the cycle with just three letters of rec from three surgeons uh, vouching that I had good perioperative skills, that I knew how to manage patients, work up patients, no patients that are healthy enough to go into the table and risks. Uh, and <laughs> luckily enough, I was able to match into anesthesia without an anesthesia letter of rec. So that's, that's pretty rare, you know, because yeah. <laughs> all my interviews, they were saying, how do you know you want to get into anesthesia? Have you done a formal <laughs> rotation before 
you know? So they were kind of questioning why I wanted, wanted to be in a field that I had minimal to no contact with. But yet and again- how, how did you respond to those questions? Well, luckily enough, I was an ICU nurse. Right. So I, you know, I managed patients on, on the vent, synchronizing them with their sedation, managing hemodyn hemodynamics with you know, pressors, um, just managing acutely ill patients. Mm -hmm. I think that was what really got me in uh, into matching into anesthesia. Because if I didn't have an anesthesia elective, it would have been pretty hard. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's pretty unheard of to get into a tough specialty, especially without the specialty specific letter of recommendation. Yeah. Um, how did you address that in your personal statement if you did? So in my personal statement, I addressed it to, um, actually when I wrote my personal statement, um, it was early enough in the cycle and I thought I was going to get a anesthesia um, elective. So mm -hmm. I didn't put it in my personal statement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that didn't come up in the personal statement. Uh, so that's a very good question, Seth. It did not come up in the personal statement because I thought I was going to get a rotation. Uh, so in the personal statement, I reemphasized managing, managing ill patients in the ICU mm -hmm. and being adapt to how patients change in a matter of like minutes. Because I can go to work one day and my patient's hemodynamics look fine, their blood pressure is great, they're setting great on the vent. And like I can be in, in my other room taking care of my other patient and I hear alarms outside and I go out to, to the screen and my patient's crashing, you know. So having yeah. to, you know, manage that. You know, and you know, anesthesia is now going to a care team model whereby you have like four CRNAs and one MD anesthesiologist. So you mm -hmm. have to be able to handle many rooms at once. So time management was key. So I think that's what, you know, I explained all that in my personal statement. Mm -hmm. so I think for the letters of recommendation, do you know if they were specifically recommending you for anesthesia, even though they weren't from that specialty? Did they mention your interest in the letters themselves? So uh, there were three surgeons that wrote me a letter of rec and mm -hmm. I did surgery towards the end of my third year. So a lot of them were asking me, oh, Paul, what do you want to get into? What specialty do you want to match into? And sometimes, you know, a lot of medical students want to be pretentious and they don't want to rough any edges and they want to say, oh, well, I'm open to everything. Well, buddy, you're in, you're in April, May. You got to know what you're getting into because UMass is coming soon. So I told them that, you know, I'm wanting to go into anesthesia. And they were, you know, they were fine with that because, you know, you, you got to be making a decision soon because your application's going to be opening. So I didn't see um, my letters of rec, but I did emphasize to them that, you know, this is my situation. When I was going to be in an anesthesia elective, I got yanked out because of COVID and other students too. And they reemphasized that, you know, throughout my rotations with them, they were, you know, kind of, as we say, pimping me, you know, they were questioning me as to, okay, this is the kind of patient that we're having today. If you're the anesthesiologist, how would you manage this manage this, this patient? What would you do? What is their ASA score? What are the potential risks on the table? What are potential risks outside the table? So I think they probably used all my answers to formulate, okay, this guy will be a good anesthesiologist from my surgical view. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And so then when it actually came to applying, how many programs did you apply to and how did you decide where you're going to apply? So I used Metro Resident, I used, um, I was always kind of, even on the island in my second, my first and second year, I, I knew about Metro Resident because mm -hmm. I'm the kind of guy I like things streamlined and Metro Resident made things very streamlined for me. It kind of gave me, okay, I have a great chance here and I probably don't have a, so much of a great chance here. So even with that said, I applied to 136 programs. Mm -hmm. And that was with a bar of like, you know, 99 or, you know, percent confidence that I'd be able to get an interview with like 60 to 70% chance I won't be able to get an interview, right? Because at this point, I'm like, I'm applying to a hard specialty. What do I have to right. lose? Let me just throw it all in there and just let's see what happens. You know, you don't want to miss out on the chance of matching because if you have a 70% chance of matching, even though it's kind of low, it doesn't mean you have a chance to match, right? Yeah. So I definitely wanted to, you know, still try. So I applied to 136 and I got seven interviews. Seven? Seven, yeah. So that's about a, what is that, like a 2%? <laughs> Did you ever have any pushback for applying to anesthesia? 
like from your school or advisors or anybody telling you, you know, you need to apply to a backup specialty or multiple backup specialties? So um, after I took my step one, so I'll be, you know, open. My step one score was at 232. Mm -hmm. So I called my uh, career guidance dean at our school and explained to him, you know, my background, my step one score. He was like, well, Paul, you know, you got to do good on step two CK. Probably what's going to help you is you you have a clinical background as a nurse, so probably step two CK will be more doable for you. Mm -hmm. But I would apply to backup specialties. Uh, mind you, I took the advice of studying hard for step two CK and I got a 245, so I improved by 13 points. But I did not take the advice by applying a second specialty. I said to yeah. myself, you know what, we're going to do anesthesia. In the event I don't match, I'm ready to soap, you know, and... Yeah. So I went about it and I was successful. Yeah, well, congratulations again. Uh, what preparations did you take to get ready for soap in case that was what you had to do? Is that if you want me to be honest with you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I took no prep. <laughs> okay. I took no prep for soap because- yeah, Mentally I, ready. <laughs> me mentally, you no, know, sometimes you're in a football game, you just got to throw a, a Hail Mary toss. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of just had to throw a Hail Mary toss, Zeph. There are some things in life you can't plan. You start to plan and be all cookie cutter. It doesn't go the way you plan it, right? So I knew that uh, the soap, it's pretty much the pre-scramble. So how does somebody plan for a scramble? It's all disorganized. You're scrambling, right? So I, I read the fine print from our school and they said, okay, it's good to write personal statements for you know, specific programs. So let's say I want to soak into prelim surgery. I can possibly write a personal statement for prelim surgery or a personal statement for prelim internal medicine. Mm -hmm. This personal statement wouldn't come off very, very genuine. It would be very cheesy because I'm just saying, please, someone take me, right? And there's also a fine print that said you can keep the personal statement you have because a lot of programs know that you didn't get into the program that you wanted to get into. So that was my plan to keep my personal statement. And in the event I was called by a program director, I would explain myself, you know, because they know prelim programs is for a year. There's no right. continuity. They have you for a year and you find your way. So anybody that was going to get me, they knew I was going to be there for a year and I would yeah. find my way. So that was my, my strategy. I know it sounds kind of gambly and it sounds kind of strategic, but hey. <laughs> At the end of the day, it, this whole ERAS and um, this whole this whole thing is somewhat like gambling. You're you're you're, you're in yeah. Vegas for a good four months. Yeah. <laughs> was there anything in your interviews that you weren't expecting or that threw you off when it came time to actually like speak with the programs and they were asking you questions? Yes, there was there was one interview I can finally remember. I won't name the program, but they were asking <laughs> like the the hurts in light, like you know our light bulb conversion when it comes to like Europe and uh, America and the amount of PSI of pressure of oxygen and like a certain atmosphere, just random question. <laughs> yeah, very random. Jeez. Uh, it was very random. I'm trying to think of the programs that asked me random questions. No, everything was kind of, you know, what are your interests? What led you to anesthesia? What can you bring to our program? Um, kind of like your background, any siblings, parents, first generation doctor, that that kind of thing. But that one program, kind of, it was one guy, and he asked my friend kind of wild questions too. Yeah. And I think the biggest one to like, if you have a great sense of awareness, if you read, right. read, read, right? if you have multiple, if you have a great sense of awareness of more things than just anesthesia, then they're like, okay, this guy is mind's kind of, you know, expanded, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If there's anything you could do differently, if you had to do the application season again, would you change anything? I would change. Let me go. Let me start off by saying I could have tried harder to get anesthesia elective. Mm -hmm. I, okay. I, I just wanted to be comfortable and I advise people not to be comfortable. If you really want something, you have to get out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. I really want an anesthesia rotation in California. Um, and that at the time that I was looking for anesthesia rotation, my grandmother recently died. So I kind of, yeah, thank you, man. Thank you, Zeph. I wanted to be close to my family. 
especially my mom, because it was her, her mom to kind of comfort her, you know, mm-hmm. help her more through the process. I want through the process too. Yeah. But if, if I could have changed something, it would have probably been to do an anesthesia elective at an SGU affiliated hospital in New York, because they were still giving electives out. We had to really hunt for them. And mm-hmm. I should have hunted more. <laughs> yeah. I think that's the one thing I would have changed in terms of um, my ERES application. And I think the second thing I would have changed, I think that's all. I think it's just that. Mm-hmm. It's pretty sound advice to <laughs> try to get that elective in the specialty you're pursuing, especially for the more competitive ones, definitely. Yep. Is there anything in particular you're hoping to bring to your field or to bring to medicine in general as you advance throughout your career? I think what I'm bringing, you know, I'm I'm a diverse candidate because I went from another healthcare specialty to another one, right? I went from nursing to being a physician. So bringing just a collaborative understanding of different disciplines and how we all work together for the same goal, I think that's what I'm wanting to bring. You know, physicians have their own aspect of how to care for patients, nurses do, PAs do, and NPs do. But at the end, you know, it's all centered around one entity right? And that entity is our patient, you know, and that's really what I'm focused on. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Do you have any final pieces of advice for future residency applicants out there? So future residency applicants, I would say start early. And I mean, starting early, meaning start in medical school um, from, you know, from your first year. Um, Talking to my fellow USMB colleagues, they were studying for step one in you know, the second semester of their first year. I, and some of the other people I knew on the island, we were studying for our step one, the second semester of our second year. So mm-hmm. we were a full year behind some people who were scoring 250s, 260s. So if you really wanna attain that score, I would say start early. But now step one is going to pass fail, right? So I would say, okay, now you're going into step two. So the information that you learn from step one, preserve it, right? Don't let it go to waste when you go into clinicals because that step one in information still comes, you know, still trickles its way into step two. Yeah, kind of, yeah, it did for me too. I was seeing step one stuff, you know, genetics, little minute genetic stuff, you know, and it, you know, resurfaced. So if you can hold that breadth of knowledge, bring it into step two, right? Also score well on your shelves, your shelf exams, because your shelf exams mimic the real exam for step two. I think you put yourself in a good position to get a great score for matching heart specialties. Um, Other advice I would give is LORs do matter. And um, you have to really perform well on your um, clinical rotations. There's an aspect of performing academically well, and performing socially well. Um, mm-hmm. Being able to read the room, <laughs> that's a big one in life, but also in medicine too, because if you're able to read the room and you're kind of tailoring your care and you're doing things in accordance with the general aura of where you are, things are gonna go well for you. And mm-hmm. if you're able to add upon that by working hard, you know, you're building, building, the, building the, the, the blocks, you do things in accordance to your general area, and now you're working hard on top of that, your LOR will come out pretty good. So that, that, that's my biggest piece of advice. Do well in your exams. Use the steps that I just talked about right now. And yeah, perform well in clinicals, academically, but also socially too. Because everybody wants a colleague they can work well with. Absolutely. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story and sharing your insights with us. And we hope you all the best for your first year of residency and everything that comes beyond that. So thank you. Thank you, Zeph. I really appreciate it. Thanks.